morning and welcome to worship today. It's so good to have all of you uh, joining us from the comfort of your own homes or wherever you may be for this virtual service on this first Sunday in June. This morning we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper, so if you have elements in your own home, bread, wine, grape juice prepared, you can commune yourselves and each other at the appointed time. Uh, by way of announcements to share that our council will be meeting Tuesday evening, 7 p.m. here at the church. And this weekend, uh, our eldest member, Bertha Dahmer, is celebrating her 102nd birthday. That's amazing. So God bless you, Bertha. That's a wonder, wonderful, wonderful milestone. Let us prepare our hearts for the Eucharist with the Confession. We worship in the name of the Triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of His Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of of your holy name, Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. And so as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of his Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us pray. O Lord our God, you are our hiding place, our refuge, our sanctuary in this, in this very busy world, and we pray that you would teach us always to seek you while you may be found, to encounter the gift that you are in all your fullness. Speak to us now words of life, hope, and salvation, for we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We confess the words of our faith expressed so beautifully in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Immediately after Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, they hide from God. Neither takes responsibility for their sin, instead blaming each other, the snake, and even God. The curse on the snake was understood as a messianic prophecy by the early church who associated Eve's offspring with Christ. Our first reading is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 15. 
Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals, and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is 130. It'll be found on page 281 of your hymnal. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to know what is done amiss, O Lord, who could stand? For there is forgiveness with you, Therefore, you shall be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for him. In my word, in his word, pardon me, is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more than watchmen in the, for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. Life in the present is transitory and cannot compare with the eternal home God has prepared for us. So we do not despair no matter what life might bring, because we know that as God raised Jesus from the dead, God promises to bring us into eternal life. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians, chapter, chapter 4, verses 13 to chapter 5, verse 1. Just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for the Sunday is from Mark's Gospel. The second chapter begins at verse 1. And when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And there were many gathered together so that there was no longer room for them, not even around the door, and he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic man lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, 
my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the religious leaders sitting there whispered to each other, why does this man speak like this? It's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, knowing in his spirit what they were discussing among themselves, said to them, why do you find this so disturbing? For which is it easier to say to the paralyzed, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your pallet and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, rise, take up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately took up the pallet and went out before them all, so that they were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this before. These are the words of the living God. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you that your word is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray that you would speak to us through it by the power of your Spirit in a way that would bring life and hope and transform us and empower us to be your faithful servants. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus returned home to Capernaum after some time away. Capernaum, we know, was his home base from where he launched his traveling ministry all around the shores of Lake Galilee. Some of us have visited there. It's a beautiful town overlooking the northern tip of the lake where some of the very best fishing is found. Jesus' name spread like wildfire, and the crowds that followed after him grew larger and larger, uh, gathering around the teacher, the healer, and the folk hero who reached out to love them in a way as they'd never known before. When word got out on social media that Jesus was home, a crowd quickly gathered and pressed in around him at the house where he was visiting and preaching, and many more stood outside the door straining to hear him, jockeying for the very best view, craning their necks just to catch a glimpse of him. They were mesmerized by this backwoods rabbi and every word he spoke. Just then, four men showed up carrying their paralyzed friend to the house on a mat, a kind of a makeshift stretcher, hoping that Jesus would have compassion and heal him. And when they arrived, they, were, they realized right away that they couldn't get anywhere near Jesus, for there were so many people blocking the door. And we have to admire their determination, because they wouldn't give up, and they wouldn't take no for an answer. So they found a creative and resourceful solution to the problem. They hoisted their sick friend, bed and all, up onto the roof of the house and started to tear the roof apart. And, and through the opening, they gently lowered him down with ropes. The scriptures literally says they dug through the roof. It's a peculiar way to describe their demolition job, but that's exactly what they did. An Israeli village from Jesus' day has been reconstructed at a place called Katsreen, up in the Golan Heights, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, where you can visit a modest house of the very kind that was so typical of ancient Galilean houses, where this very miracle story took place at Capernaum, long ago. And you can check it out on the internet if you just Google Katzreen, it's spelled K-A-T-Z-R-I-N, Katzreen, and there you'll see an authentic house, the kind referenced here in Mark's Gospel. Uh, the houses were built of stones with dirt floors. They were typically very small and dark with tiny windows if they had any windows at all. The roofs were flat with wooden poles secured from one side, one exterior wall to the other exterior wall, and there were slats over top of them to support dirt, sod, and grass covering it all. 
So that's why Mark's Gospel tells us about digging through the roof to open a hole, because that's exactly what the four friends did. Just imagine what a sight it must have been. As Jesus was preaching that day, when all of a sudden, a paralyzed man appeared lowered down through the roof, right in front of him. Talk about being upstaged. Jesus stopped mid-sentence, absolutely speechless. I remember when a few of my church services were interrupted, too, throughout the years. Uh, one morning, an elderly man passed out and had to be carried out of church. Uh, not so very far away from here, one Sunday evening at the Alberta Hospital uh, up in Edmonton, many years ago, uh, I made the mistake of asking uh, rhetorical questions in my sermon, and the psych patients shouted back some shocking and embarrassing answers that really caught me off guard and steered the sermon off the rails. While preaching at an outdoor Easter sunrise service, I had to walk over and pick up and prop up an intoxicated woman who couldn't stand up on her own, and I had to do it uh, more than once. At last week's funeral service, the wind was howling with such ferocity through the trees out there in our cemetery, I had to stop and wait for it to quiet down just a little bit so I could make myself heard. But I've never had someone break through the church roof and lower down on a stretcher while preaching, and I don't know what I would do if it ever happened. What's the take-home message from this story about four guys and their paralyzed friend who created so much drama when they interrupted Jesus' sermon that day? Four of a kind beats a full house. Four of a kind beats a full house. Jesus was amazed, touched, and astounded by their determination. It was faith in action that was tenacious, bold, and courageous. It all speaks volumes, too, about just how much they really loved and cared for their helpless friend. The Apostle Paul calls this faith active in love. Mark's Gospel says, when Jesus saw their faith, uh, because they put their faith into action. In the Gospel accounts, we, we never read that Jesus was impressed by church budgets, splashy new programming, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge technology, or multi-million dollar church building campaigns. But we do find again and again, he was impressed with demonstrations of faith, even mustard seed sized faith. Hans Nielsen Hauge, the Norwegian reformer and renewer of the church, called this a living faith. It's not armchair faith, simply a matter of believing all the right doctrines, but trusting God uh, by putting our faith into action. Do you and I have that same tenacious faith? That trusting faith, that doesn't give up and doesn't take no for an answer. Is Jesus amazed because he sees our faith in action? Do others see and take notice of our faith in action? Faith is spelled R-I-S-K, risk. And maturity of faith means we don't easily become discouraged and give up when roadblocks and obstacles and daunting circumstances get in the way. The fabulous four who brought their sick friend and their needy friend to Jesus uh, so that he could heal and restore him were desperate and so determined. They did everything they could do and then they trusted Jesus to do what only he can do. And that's the kind of living faith Jesus calls us to put into practice day by day. Faith is like a muscle. It grows when it's used. Jesus looked with compassion at the paralyzed man lying helpless on the pallet and said, My son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the religious leaders were quick to take offense, as they always were, and so they whispered to each other, Just who does this guy think he is? This is blasphemy. 
Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus heard them and wouldn't let it go, so he challenged them with a question. You're such skeptics. Which of the two is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or take up your mat and walk? Now this is a very tricky question that Bible scholars have puzzled over for 20 centuries. Countless pages and commentary have been written on this very question. How would you answer it? On the one hand, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven because it doesn't require any evidence to know for certain that the person truly is forgiven or not. Anybody can say your sins are forgiven, but to say take up your mat and walk is a whole different story because it requires verifiable evidence to prove you really have power and authority to heal. So in order to prove Jesus has authority to forgive sin, he commands the paralyzed man, take up your bed and walk. So the implication is it's a whole lot more difficult to heal someone than forgive their sins. So Jesus performs the, the healing miracle because that's the one that's harder to do, to prove then that he also has power to forgive sin, which is so much easier. But this question has more than one correct answer. There's also a pretty good case for arguing it's harder to say your sins are forgiven because that requires Jesus' death on the cross. It's possible for others to perform healing miracles too, but Jesus alone has power and authority to forgive sin. But in order to prove that he has power to forgive sin, which really means he's in fact God in flesh, the promised deliverer, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. And the man did exactly that. In front of that packed house, he got up, grabbed his stretcher and walked out of the door as the people stepped aside to make way for him. And as the scripture literally says, the crowd was out of their minds. They were beside themselves with astonishment. The story teaches us that though Jesus cares about our physical healing, he's also much more interested in healing our whole and entire being. Long before the medical profession got excited about holistic healing, Jesus was pioneering holistic health and healing for our physical, emotional, mental, psychological, and spiritual being because it's all integrally related. Yes, he raised up the paralyzed man, but at the heart of the story is the, his greater miracle of spiritual healing when he pronounces, your sins are forgiven. For Jesus knows something the paralyzed, the four friends, and the crowd didn't know, that the paralyzed man had a far bigger problem than simply his physical condition. The root problem within the human condition is sin, alienation from God, living in rebellion against God. Our real problem isn't, or is rather, is trying to build our lives and our identity on anything other than Jesus. And I love the way Martin Luther put it. We ask God for silver, but he gives us gold instead. Isn't that great? Uh, Jesus wants to give us something infinitely better than simply getting our deepest wish. He's a whole lot more than a miracle worker or a genie in a bottle. He's the Savior. He wants us to go deeper. There was nothing wrong, of course, with a paralyzed man's passionate desire to walk again, but Jesus wanted him to go much deeper. Uh, there's nothing wrong with you and I wanting physical healing, that coveted career advancement, that special relationship, success and respect, but Jesus wants to give us so much more. He wants us to go so much deeper 
Because though we think getting our deepest wish will heal and save us, it never satisfies and makes us entirely happy. We often hear it said, uh, the only thing worse than not getting what we want is getting what we want. The insightful writer C.S. Lewis put it this way, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted, fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot begin to imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased." End of quote. So don't settle for second best. Let's go deeper and receive God's very best. What we need most of all is forgiveness. And forgiveness is found only in Jesus. Uh, whether we know it or not, we yearn for relationship with him, the one who loves us more than anyone else ever can. That's why we were created in the first place, for Jesus alone can heal our discontent. And the only way that can happen is for Jesus to die on the cross. The New Testament word that appears in the original text is sozo. It means to heal, but it also translates to save, to make whole. Jesus came to heal not only our bodies, but most of all to heal all of us and to make us entirely whole, body, mind, and spirit. And he made all this possible by his atoning death on the cross, for as Isaiah the prophet teaches, by his cross he makes us whole and by his stripes we are healed. So let's go deeper with tenacious faith to receive all that Jesus wants to give us, surrender to him and invite him to come and heal the damaged places in our lives. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we invoke your blessing as we worship together in your presence and encounter you in a new and fresh way. With the ancient songwriter of Israel, our innermost being waits for you and hopes in you, for your steadfast love is greater than life itself. And with you there is forgiveness for our past, healing for our brokenness, new life, and redemption for all who turn to you in their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us bold and courage to do what it takes, whatever it takes, to bring our needs before you and to bring our others to you, to, they might receive your healing touch, even as those determined and desperate seekers brought their paralyzed friend to you so long ago. And give us faith to go deeper, to receive all that you want for us, the forgiveness, life, and salvation that you alone can give. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our hearts are wrenched by news reports of a mass grave discovered near Kamloops at the residential school grounds where bodies of unnamed children were buried so long ago, without even the dignity of a funeral and without the knowledge of their own parents and families. Forgive us and our nation for this unspeakable tragedy and injustice and for the sin of racism in all its forms. Bring healing and reconciliation to our wounded nation with sincere repentance, commitment to right wrongs, and to love all of our neighbors as we love ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you would bring comfort to Ray Hebner, family and friends who grieve Linda's passing this last week following her long cancer battle. Thank you that she's now with you and at peace in her eternal home that you've gone before us all to prepare. Thank you for the good news of gradual relaxing of pandemic restrictions, and the hope that our lives will soon return to normalcy. 
All these things in our silent prayers we bring before you now in the name of our dearest Lord and Savior Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for in mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so we give you thanks for the salvation that you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send out your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We remember how it was in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and blessed it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And how in the same manner also after they'd eaten, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. This is the body of Christ, which is given for you. And this is the blood of Christ, which is shed for you. So we invite you now in your own homes, if you commune yourselves and one another. The body of our Lord Jesus and his precious blood, whereby he has made full satisfaction for all of your sins and mine, may it now strengthen and preserve you in true faith 
and to life everlasting. His peace be with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you always. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.